Hi, I'm Susie Boss. I'm here in my backyard in Portland, Oregon, uh, where I work as an author focusing on education and specifically on project-based learning. Uh, I, I write regularly for Edutopia and I'm on the national faculty of the Buck Institute for Education. But I'm here today to talk with you a bit about my favorite topic, which is innovation. Um, one of my books, Bringing Innovation to School, takes a close look at what's happening in classrooms across the U.S. Um, and what's happening around the world in terms of creative ideas, innovative ideas, world-changing ideas in some cases. Um, so let's start by digging into um, coming to some common understanding. What are we talking about when we talk about innovation? And why is it so darn important that we spend so much energy and emphasis um, focusing on it as a national goal or really an international goal for education. So when I encourage schools to um, kind of start down this road of thinking about innovation and getting their students to the point of being innovators themselves, helping them learn how to innovate, I encourage them to start by making sure they really are talking about the same thing, that they have some common language. and. Often you'll find that folks will um, use the terms creativity and innovation almost interchangeably, as if they were synonyms. And I don't think they are. I think it's important to pause and consider the differences. So when you think about creativity, it's often about that spark of coming up with an original idea. Um, I think we, we know the creative impulse is just part of being human. Uh, it goes way back in our, all the way back to prehistory, we can find um, you know, there's evidence of, of creativity with us throughout the ages. But I think when we look at innovation, it has a more practical feel. Um, not so much about personal, personal expression, but more about problem solving. Um, how are we going to come up with a new idea that in some ways makes things better? Um, so innovation is not just new, but somehow qualitatively better, an improvement over where we were before. And often you can look at innovation and look for innovation and see it um, best in hindsight. Um, once a truly innovative idea has taken hold, it creates what you might call a new normal. There's a new context. Um, and it's hard to imagine how did we ever get along without doing things this way? Or, for example, um, take something as, as commonplace as the automobile. Um, how did we ever operate? How did we ever get around um, before we had? you know, the automobile and all of that unleashed in terms of future innovations um, and consequences. And more recently, um, our mobile devices. You know, it, it's hard for us, I think, to imagine uh, that phones weren't always so portable and so accessible. But now that they're here, we're just used to that. It's the way we roll. Um, and there are all kinds of other innovations built on top of that platform. You can look at all the, all the apps um, that exist because we have this new platform for innovation that other new ideas can, can, um, can bounce off of. So it's important to have that conversation. Define these terms for yourself. Um, come up with your own understanding of what is innovation all about. And think about why does it matter so much? Why is it so important in terms of um, just being a, a goal of education today? When we think about 21st century learning, um, a term that has been used now uh, going on a couple of decades and we're still talking about it and still defining it. Innovation is usually a key part of the mix, um, a, a key goal in, in what we think of as the 21st century learning learner. And, and the reasons we're often, um, that are often given for why innovation is so important are, are, tend to be economic. Innovation is what drives our economy. Um, you know, creative ideas, um, create new jobs and create new industries and, and create that kind of economic capital. But in my way of thinking and in the research that I've been doing and the writing I've been doing, I think we um, limit ourselves, we do ourselves and our students a disservice if we only look at innovation as a springboard um, for products that can be sold, if we, if we look at it only from the economic side. It's really about problem solving. And if we think about making the world a better place, um, innovation can be that engine that drives us toward a better, um, more fair, more just future. And I think for our students, that's really an exciting place to begin to understand what's innovation all about 
how do I learn to get good at this? And how can I think in the way that innovators do to solve problems that I really care about? And I think that's gonna be the sweet spot for the education world to embrace innovation on their own terms and then to start to think strategically about how do we help students acquire this tool set that's going to help them go forward into this 21st century and be the problem solvers and the creators of new and um, practical and innovative solutions uh, that are going to lead to you know a better future for them. So um, the way I've come at this subject is is by thinking about strategies. You know if we look at um, a completed product, something innovated that exists, whether it's the iPhone or um, you know, some medical device, um, we see the polished final product, but we don't know the backstory of it. We don't know what strategies led into the creation of it. We don't know how many false starts and um, failed first attempts and iterations there were in coming to that great final solution. So I think it's really important to kind of part the curtains uh, it, it, if you were in a museum, it would be like reading the backstory of a picture. You know, what was the story behind this painting that led to this masterpiece? So I think we can take apart some innovative um, products and solutions and start looking for strategies that went into the creation of them um, and think about how do we make those strategies teachable? How do we help our students think in the same way that innovators think? Because that's what we're really talking about here, our thinking skills and problem solving skills and skills of working together with others who have good ideas to share. Um, and those are all very teachable things, even though innovation may seem like some um, wonderful magic potion, it's, it's actually a process that we can teach our students to use and to get really good at and to use again and again and again in different contexts throughout their lives. So, you know, there are a number of, of ways to think about this, a number of strategies we can borrow when we look at great ideas and how they came into being. Um, and, and I'm going to run through a, a few examples from around the world just to give us a sense of um, just what a global phenomenon um, you know that we're talking about here and how innovation leads to the kinds of problem solving I'm talking about in this kind of social sector um, not so much for economic problem solving but for making the world a better place um, a couple of examples that I, I looked at um, in the book um, and in my my research um, there are many to choose from uh, but I'll just pull one out of the hat and, and this I think shows you a little bit about how innovators think and and how their early life experiences, what your students might be experiencing right now, sets the stage for future problem solving. And one of my favorite examples is a project called Hero Rat. Um, it, if you see an image, if you were to Google Hero Rat and look at their website, um, I think the larger organization is called Apopo, A-P-O-P-O. -O. Um, and you will see, um, a picture that's kind of startling. It's a rat hooked up to sort of a harness device um, and it's being used for landmine detection in Africa and in other parts of the developing world where there's not um, ready access to this expensive equipment to detect landmines. And the result of that is there are still mines you know left there from decades ago from past conflicts um, that cause um, horrible damage um, physical harm to often to farmers, children, people who are in the fields. Um, so this solution to come up with uh, a rat that can sniff out landmines, a uh, very affordable solution, to understand where this idea came from, kind of a wild idea, you have to kind of go back in time and think about the inventor of the idea, the innovator. His name's Bart Wiegens and he's an engineer from Belgium. But when he was a child, he, he um, had rats as pets, and they were very trainable and teachable, and he thought they were very smart. Um, so fast forward, he becomes an engineer. He's working on these sorts of um, complex issues in Africa, and he's trying to come up with a better solution um, that's going to um, allow the removal of these mines um, much more quickly and more affordably. Somewhere in uh, his memory, uh, you know, this triggers the ability of, of these rats that he once worked with 
have a great sense of smell and um, are very trainable um, and reproduce fairly quickly. They're rats after all. Um, and certain species of them are very good at working with humans. And so he developed a whole protocol for um, training um, and teaching these rats to be sniffers, to sniff out landmines, to work with their human rat handlers. So he, essentially he created a whole new job category in places in the world where jobs are in, in high um, need. Um, and these have become the hero rats. And uh, you can read about them online or um, you know, see videos of them in action. But I think what's interesting here is that the innovator's mindset that, you know, he had this idea, this kind of wild spark of an idea, but then he went through a whole process of uh, working through kind of the engineering and design process of figuring out how this would work, how to improve upon it, what sort of training would be required, what sort of um, job training would be required for the handlers and all of that. But I think what's really interesting about this is that it didn't stop there. So the hero rat goes off and um, there's a whole um, class of them who are sniffing out landmines and getting those out of the ground, having great success. But this innovator doesn't stop there. He thinks about what else could we use this same strategy for? You know, we've come up with a low cost, replicable, replicable strategy for um, solving one problem, addressing one problem. We have other problems. What else could we solve in a similar way? And so the, the next iteration of the hero rats is um, to use them um, in much the same way, but in this case, they're, they're being used for medical detection. And they're actually very trainable, can be um, taught to be um, kind of lab rats, literally, but in, instead of the way we usually think of lab rats, they are actually the ones who are detecting um, the evidence of tuberculosis from um, sputum samples. So in places that don't have access to traditional medical labs, the rats can be used. They're very um, effective, trainable, um, all those things. And, you know, I, th I think when you look at an example like that and you start to get an understanding of the innovator's mind that um, they can be very resourceful, can come at, at solutions in a whole different way from what already exists, um, leading to a, a quicker, faster way of problem solving, sometimes a much more affordable, and having enormous benefits um, for people who would otherwise be um, kind of stuck without access to the kind of solution that he's come up with. So that's just one example. So I think you, what you can do with a story like that, and you know, you, storytelling is one of those hooks to get students interested in ideas. I think you can go from a story of someone um, working very much as a global innovator. You have this European trained engineer um, from Belgium working on a, uh, an issue in the developing world in Africa. Um, coming up with solutions that work very much at the local level there, creating kinds of new sorts of jobs and um, helping to solve a, a very dire local problem. You can use a story like that and help students think about, okay, what are the strategies that this innovator used that I could use? Um, part of it is just taking a look at the process that he went through of identifying a problem, being willing to take a risk and come at an, a problem with some unorthodox solutions. Um, when he probably first proposed using sniffer rats um, uh, for a problem that, that was more often addressed with very expensive um, land mine detection equipment, he might have raised some eye eyebrows. So he had that risk taker ability to go in and say, I've got a different way to come at this. Um, let's give it a try. Then to iterate and go through a number of cycles of trying and improving on solutions. You know, you can use stories like his as an example of how do innovators think. And then you can also take a look at not stopping. You know, he wasn't content to stop with one solution, but then what can we keep doing? How do we kind of keep going with this? And I think any number of examples of innovators at work, um, having those at your fingertips, having stories to share, and then to be able to kind of roll out from those, what are the strategies at work here? So often you'll find that um, people who come up with very innovative solutions have a resourcefulness about them. They're able to see opportunities where other people don't. They're able to find uh, materials to work with where other people don't see anything but scarcity. And I've offered, um, you know, in my writing, a number of examples, um, everything from a, a project here in my hometown of Portland called the Rebuilding Center uh, that takes used construction materials 
um, it, it's essentially a lumber yard made out of used construction materials that are gathered up from stuff that would have otherwise gone to the dump. Um, instead of getting put in the dump, it's sorted and cleaned and made available um, for uh, you know repairing and rebuilding houses. But it's that idea that taking something that looks like trash and turning it into treasure is one of those innovative strategies. And once your students become aware of this and start thinking about what do we actually have around us that's um, a resource we could use, um, it opens their eyes in a way that gets them thinking about opportunities um, and gets them thinking about problem solving. Um, just, just uh, I think last week I read about some innovators in uh, London who are coming up with a solution of using um, newspapers that are left behind in the subways and the trains every day, just piles of newspapers, you can imagine. They're kind of handed out in the subways in the tube and then left behind by riders after they've read them. So they're gathering up these newspapers and using them to make um, kind of one-time use bicycle helmets. Now, why would you need a throwaway bicycle helmet or a, a one-time use bike helmet? And it's because there's a, a new um, bike sharing uh, service in London, a kind of a popular idea that's catching on in cities around the world where you can kind of rent bikes by the hour. Um, and, and, you know, instead of having to use your own bike for commuting, you can uh, use bikes that are already there and rent them by the hour, um, but bike helmets aren't part of the deal. And so these guys have come up with a way to, to take these um, discarded newspapers, turn them into um, very inexpensive to make bike helmets, which can be reused and repurposed over and over again. If they get wet, it doesn't matter, they're going to be recycled again into more helmets anyways. But again, that's this example of resourcefulness, finding opportunities everywhere. Um, where others might not see them. I was just talking with a teacher whose um, school is adding a maker space because they want students to have that chance to kind of mess around with making stuff, tinkering with prototypes as they begin to think about possible um, solutions or products they might make. They want them to be able to make their thinking really visible with great prototypes. Um, you know, that kind of capture their thinking right in that rough stage. They needed a bunch of resources to work with, didn't have much of a budget. Uh, so he, this teacher, recognized that there's an ongoing supply of cardboard coming from the pizza boxes in the cafeteria. So they recycle the cardboard, they use it for prototyping, all kinds of stuff. But I think once you acquire the lens of looking for resources, looking for what can we use that's right in front of us, um, and how can we use it as a new solution? That's part of this innovator's mindset. And I'll share one last story along those lines. And there are many other strategies that, that innovators use that um, you, know, you can read about and, and explore. But one more um, example of the kind of getting kids to think about what do we have a lot of that, and a ready supply of that we could use in a new way. I was working with some students in um, a rural community they were trying to think of a way to attract more people to their kind of dying town. It was one of these kind of small towns losing population. And as a service project, students were trying to think about how could we get people to visit here? What do we have that's appealing? And one girl, by asking herself kind of aloud, thinking aloud about, well, what do we have a lot of here? We're in this kind of farm belt area, um, away from everything. And she said, you know what we have a lot of? We have a lot of stars. She really hit on an interesting idea that, indeed, places far from the city lights, you know, you can just see stars in ways that you can't in the big cities. And that was the spark of an idea for her to start thinking about, we could have astronomy events here and, you know, it would attract people to our community. It kind of got her started down a whole path just by getting started by thinking, you know, strategically, what do we have a lot of, what's right under our noses um, that we could use as a resource. Uh, to come at a solution. So I think, you know, helping your kids think about strategies, um, taking ideas apart, and then kind of going backwards, where did this innovative idea come from? Who came up with it? What was the process? They start to take some of the mystery out of this process, and they start to see themselves as the kind of folks who can be both thinkers and doers, people who come up with ideas and can put them into practice and make innovation happen.